Hey guys, what's up? Rich Schneider right here, Night Report. I'm joined by Ryan Roberts of Rise and Draft. Ryan, how's everything going, man? Everything's good, man. How are you? I can't complain at all. So um, I know it's super early to be talking 2022 NFL draft, but uh, I mean, Rutgers has a couple of dudes that could get drafted this year or next year, whatever. But uh, yeah, I know. Uh, I know. It's it's never too early to talk draft. Never <laughs> too early, and they do. They absolutely have. They have some good football players this year, so I'm excited about it. Awesome. So I'm, uh, first off, I'm going to ask you to just kind of introduce yourself and just tell everyone here um, kind of how you got started into um, college football scouting. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, I had been, you know, just kind of freelancing for a long time. And then I, a couple of years ago, I caught on with um, NFL Draft Bible, which is now the leading source of NFL Draft content on the Sports Illustrated platform. Okay. I recently left uh, their platform and now I'm working both with um, Expand the Box Score and Coast to Coast Scouting as well as I'm now a regional scout for the College Gridiron Showcase based mm-hmm. down in, in uh, Texas every year. They just had um, 12 players drafted in the 2021 cycle, uh, 70 other players that signed contracts. So that's kind of just the real brief glimpse. And, um, and now I'm kind of doing it more on a regionalized scale, but still mm-hmm. obviously keeping a, a wider scope of the scouting world. So obviously you're from South Jersey. You, I've seen your tweets. You're tweeting a lot about uh, two guys in particular from Rutgers and Bo Melton and even Isaiah Pacheco. How much of a chance do these two have to get drafted, do you think? I, th- I think that when we're talking about Bo Melton, I think he has a really mm-hmm. good chance. Um, I actually had an interview with Bo a, a few weeks ago, and I have a, yeah. a, um, an article that's coming out about him. But, I mean, so being a South Jersey guy, like I was very, <laughs> you know, I, I had seen Bo in high school at Cedar Creek. I had seen yeah. Isaiah Pacheco um, during his high school career as well. I, I think Bo has a legitimate chance because he has the track background as well. Mm-hmm. And I think he's going to be a guy that's going to test really well. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's if he hits into the four threes as an athlete. And I think that the NFL is always going to value that type of speed at wide receiver. And then, I mean, this past year, you know, working with Coach Underwood, Tyquan Underwood, mm-hmm. obviously a great Rutgers wide receiver in his own right. I feel yeah, like of course. he <laughs> went from a, a good secondary option to, you know, one of the best wide receivers in the Big Ten. So I, I think Bo has a, a tremendous shot, especially if he tests well during the 2022 process. And then, I mean, you asked about Pacheco. I know Pacheco's stats weren't fantastic this year, but every time you, you pop on the tape of him against a Ohio State in 2019 and a couple other big schools, I feel like he does mm-hmm. really well, and he's got that prototypical like 5'11", 210, 215, physical runner. I don't think that there's like su- anything super dynamic about him, but I think that he has that physicality, that strength, and then he's explosive in short areas. So he might be a later day three guy if he is selected, mm-hmm. but I, I think that Bo Melton, if – he tests well and he has another great season to end out his career. I think he could sneak maybe into day two somewhere. Like I, third round, I don't think is out of the question with that type of athleticism and that type of speed at the next level. Yeah. So talk, going back to Bo a little bit and talking a little more about him. Um, obviously he only had, I think like, I shouldn't say only, but he had like 600 receiving yards last year. Is it, is the like one K mark that everyone thinks you have to get every year overrated you think in terms of NFL draft prospects? I think it is, especially in this past year where, I mean, uh, we're talking about a Big Ten season that was abbreviated anyway. Yeah, yeah. So like, I think true. that it's a per game mark is much more important than like just the fact that he had 600 yards. I think he averaged right, right around 100 yards a game, which is a, a great mark. Yeah. I mean, would he like to go out this year and play, you know, 12 games plus and have a thousand yards? Like that would be fantastic. And I think he can do that in the full slate. So I think it can be a little underrated because, I mean, no offense is, is – created equally you know we're talking about you know different mm-hmm. situations with the COVID-19 pandemic and conference shutdowns but then we're also talking about like hey who's this quarterback what teams are they playing what's the offensive scheme I think there's a lot of factors it would be nice to obviously hit that 1k mark because that means that you're a really productive player but I think the per game numbers on Bo Melton last year were fantastic and I think that people are going to take notice of that so now he's obviously pretty versatile. They use him in just about everything, returns, that wide receiver, even on a couple of run plays here and there. But uh, I guess if this is a tough question to answer, I know for most people, but if you had to compare him to any former player or even a current NFL player, who would you compare him to his game like? I wouldn't say that he's quite to the caliber of a Will Fuller, who obviously was okay. a former first round pick out of Notre Dame. So like, I'm not saying that Bo is quite up to that standard, but like, I think mm-hmm. that, from a size perspective, from a play style perspective, I think there are some parallels to the degree of like 
they are deep threats. They can threaten a, a defense, obviously, vertically with that type of game speed. But then also he mm -hmm. creates a lot of instant separation because he puts a lot of stress on guys vertically. And then he is able to snap in and out of breaks really well. So I, I think that there is kind of that you're, you're never going to you know, he's never going to be confused with an X receiver where like he has this incredible size and he's incredibly physical. But like I think that mm -hmm. he has a niche at the next level that teams are really going to value. And he's a guy, honestly, with the type of speed and athleticism he has, he's, you just get the football in his hands in any way you can. So I think that there are some parallels stylistically to a Will Fuller, not mm -hmm. a direct comparison, but like role at the next level, I think could be similar. All right. And then what about uh, Pacheco? I know he's kind of like the hard nose running back that most people, I guess, was kind of like nowadays. Yeah, um, I, I think maybe a. Uh, Again, maybe a lesser comparison, but maybe like a Jordan Howard that has kind of bounced okay. around. He's been a really productive player for the Chicago Bears and then it hasn't been as productive since he left and went to the Eagles, obviously seeing him play a ton there. But like I think stylistically, mm -hmm. again, not a direct comparison because I'm not saying that he's going to break into the NFL and have, you know, multiple thousand yard seasons early on in his career. But I think yeah. Jordan Howard brings a good amount of explosiveness in short areas. He has those things working for him. So I don't think that he's a guy that's ever going to be like three down back, helps you in pass the pass game a ton. But mm -hmm. I think that he can bring something to you as a one to two down physical runner that gets vertical in a hurry. Gotcha. So now obviously Rutgers also has a couple of dudes on defense. I've seen you talk about Tyshawn Fogg a little bit, but I, I want to say that more talented linebacker of the two might be uh, Alakani, Alakunle Fadukasi. It's a mouthful, but, uh, what, what stands out about those two guys? I know um, they're both extremely talented out of high school, uh, big, highly rated kids, and now they're dominating the Big Ten, it seems like. Yeah, I loved Fog last summer going into the 2020 season. Um, I haven't seen a ton of him from 2020, but I heard that he had a little bit of a down year. So I'm excited to get back into his tape. But like what? Mm -hmm. So the difference is for me, it's like Fadakasi played, but like he didn't break out until this past year right so like honestly, yeah i had had my attention on fog i think the fog is just super consistent i think his run fits mm -hmm. are solid i think he's a he's your, your standard mike linebacker at the next level who is always going to be a dependable football player not incredibly flashy but then like there's some plays against ohio state i remember 2019 like where mm -hmm. they're running outside zone and i mean he is running down guys from the back side so <laughs> there is yeah. some potential as a pursuit player, but I think physicality wise, he fits that two down type of middle linebacker role. Mm -hmm. Matakasi is a completely different player. So I, I saw that he's listed around the same weight as Tyshawn Fogg, but I find it yeah. very hard to believe that they are the same weight because Fadakasi is a little bit lighter built. Yeah, he's, of that, course. he's that traditional, like he's your run and chase will linebacker. Like he's the Jerome Bakers of the world. Like he is mm -hmm. not going to be incredibly physical at the point of attack but he is going to be a guy that has good speed working in pursuit. I'm sure he's going to be a fantastic special teams player, which I think is going to be huge for a guy like that. who's going to test. Well, he had the, obviously the breakout year. And I think mm. at the end of the day, both players could be draftable players if they both test well. And obviously they end out their career on the right note. Yeah. So we just talked about how the whole, uh, I guess, Fog going back to 2019 and then talking about Fadokasi this past season. How much do you think this COVID season being the whatever it was, whatever you want to call it, uh, is going to affect like NFL draft boards? You think people are going to use the tape kind of less from that or more from that season just because of everything that happened? Well, the good news is for these guys is that they're going to have a normal season to end on. For of course. To answer your question directly, for the 2021 NFL draft guys, it mm -hmm. was, I mean, that was the last tape. So how it kind of works in, the NFL level is scouts yeah. are going to watch the the most previous season that a team that a player played. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the 2020 college football season. They're not even going to really go back to 2019. The only time they would have went back to 2019 is if a player was injured and hadn't yeah. played much. So then they would go back to 2019. So honestly, Fog, if he has a great year in 2021. They won't even look back at the 2020 if it wasn't that. Of great. course, yeah. Fadakasi, like, although he had a breakout year in 2020, if the 2021 season isn't good, then that's just kind of what they're going to be dealing with. It's kind of what have you done mm -hmm. for me lately uh, in the NFL draft circles. Okay. So it definitely hurt this past cycle, but I think 2022 specifically, it's it's not going to hurt a ton. It's going to be about what do they put on film in 2021. All right. And then obviously Rutgers has a couple defensive backs too I want to talk about. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with them at all, a little bit kind of. So, like, obviously, Trey Avery, Avery Young, and Patrice Renee are probably the top three defensive backs, I'd say, on the team. What, what kind of potential do these guys have? I know Patrice Renee technically just got drafted number four or five, whatever it was, in the, uh, the CFL draft. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, I haven't seen him a ton. I'll say the one guy that I have watched a lot. I haven't gotten to Trey Avery yet. Avery mm-hmm. Young is the guy that I have seen, and I have seen a lot of people with high opinions of him. I've seen mm-hmm. some guys putting him, you know, and this is the media perspective. So like, I don't have the NFL insight on this on this, but I've seen some people put him in the first round conversation, which is yeah. pretty interesting. I will say he is listed at 6'1", 205. He is mm-hmm. very physical. He plays press man corner, but I think that he has a varying skill set where he could play multiple coverages. Mm-hmm. I want to see him kind of improve on, hey, wide receivers, when you have your back turn, it's tough to be able to stay in and out of breaks with guys. It's hard to stay glued down the football field until you see the football in the air. I think mm-hmm. he struggles in those areas a little bit, but like from a physicality perspective, from a just pure athleticism perspective, I would say that he's firmly in the day two conversation, somewhere to second or the third round, and he could be a, a nice riser if he has that type of season and he's able to have a little more ball production. Because I know the mm. interception no- total was a little down. I think the pass breakup yeah. numbers were good, but he's kind of reminds me a little bit of, and, and again, not to the to the same degree, but like going into the twenty twenty season. Everybody knew who J.C. Horn was from South Carolina, of course. But, but nobody was putting him up in the first round conversation a ton in the summer. Well, most people weren't because yeah. he hadn't had ball production at that level yet. And then he has a couple of interceptions and people start to take more notice. And I think Avery Young is in the similar stratosphere where it's mm-hmm. only going to take a couple interceptions for him to finally get people's attention that he deserves. So he actually, he actually moved to safety this past spring. I guess they're kind of experimenting to see what they could do here and there. Do you think that would kind of help him and help his draft prospects or would it hurt him or kind of indifferent? I, I, I think, I think the more you can do always helps. It's mm-hmm. um, so the reason I liked JC a ton going back to that summer was because JC, his true freshman year had played inside at nickel and then he had played two mm-hmm. years on outside. So he had that inside outside versatility Gotcha. And for a NFL that is becoming more and more like, hey, we want to play man coverage across the board, and it's dictated yeah. by creating mismatches offensively, having a guy like an Avery Young potentially at that size that could play, hey, on on this play, DeAndre Hopkins is lined up in the boundary. Go cover him. Oh, now they're moving him into the slot. He's playing Devontae Adams. Devontae Adams plays everywhere on the Green Bay mm-hmm. Packers team. Having a guy that can potentially move inside out, play man coverage, I think is a big bonus in today's NFL. Mm -hmm. So now two guys, I'm not sure how much you'll know about these guys, but they're special teams, obviously, and they're not always getting drafted. They're they're most most of the time you'll probably get picked up at free agency or even like a rookie camp. Adam Corsack, the punter and Billy Taylor, the long snapper. Um, They're two. I would say they're two of the higher ranked guys in terms of long snapping and punting. What are the chances of those guys even making it to the league? I don't know too much about Taylor, but I can tell you Corsack early on, I've heard a lot of people talking about him being in the first punter off the board conversation. Right. He's obviously has the Australian background, which all those guys are coming from Australia at this point. Of course. And, um, yeah. The Australian rules <laughs> punter craze, like it's, it's going to continue yeah. too. And, and I think Corsack is, I think mean, he was like 6'2", 180 listed. He's got that mm-hmm. longer frame. You know, he's got, he can still fill out a little bit, but he's got a really talented leg. He's, he's very good directional punting. Um, I think that he has a very good chance at the end of the day to potentially be the first punter off the board, depending on how it shakes out. Mm-hmm. And I completely forgot, and I completely blanked on this one before, but you find my J, a transfer out of Temple. Obviously, no year, not as good stats-wise, but 2019, I think he was all AAC first team, I believe. Um, but I know I've seen him as high as projected as a fifth rounder. That was from, I don't, I don't even know who the media guy was, but it was was like a couple months ago as a fifth rounder. And now he's back at, back with his old defensive line coach, Jim Panagos at Rutgers. Have you heard anything about him at all? Or I think they have two defensive linemen that are pretty interesting. You you mentioned Maje, obviously the the temple transfer, very Mm -hmm. productive in 2019. Like you said, he did not have quite the 2020 that he had. I I think he was dealing with, you know, everything COVID related was a little tough on some guys, but he is Mm -hmm. not your biggest defensive tackle in the world, but he has some pass rush potential. And I I think that he has a a solid enough first step. I think he understands leverage. I don't think he's ever going to be a guy that you're going to put out there on every down, just because I don't think that he has the the power profile to play on, on obvious running situations. Mm -hmm. I think he has a little bit of juice. I think he could be somewhere on day three. And then the other guy, uh, Julius Turner, who is a very undersized nose tackle in the defense, number 50, who is like, Listed at 265 pounds or something, something like that. Like I think that. he put on a little since then, but 
Yeah. So like he's like 265 or 270 or whatever it is in that ballpark. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that size just does not sell on the interior. But you watch yeah. this game against Ohio State, especially last year, working against mm-hmm. Josh Myers, who was the second center <laughs> drafted in the second yeah. round, like very yeah. good football player. <laughs> He ate his lunch all day, and I, I know he's a former wrestler, and he's got kind of that background to him. Mm. I'm interested, and I have tabs on Julius Turner because although he is the six foot, two hundred seventy pounds right now, if he can get up to the two hundred eighty something pound mark, and he continues to be a, a pest on the interior, I think he has a good first step. I think he's got good hands. I think he has natural leverage. I don't know if he has a ton of upside as a player, but mm. I wouldn't be shocked if he if he measures in well good enough that if he's a draftable player when all of a sudden now would you say like that height's kind of too short for a defensive tackle or do you think it's like good enough to get under that pad level and everything or it, it depends what exactly the height is um I mm. mean, so i would probably say it's a little under six foot maybe like maybe under, right on that mark but if it's under six foot then he's in very rare territory and, and he's yeah. in outlier status he's with guys like puna ford who mm-hmm is 5'11 and some change and has been yeah. a very good player with the Seattle Seahawks. But the problem is like outside of him, there's not many guys that are that size. So yeah. it's going to be difficult if he can hit that six foot mark, even though six foot is still small for a defensive tackle. I think it helps him tremendously because then you're talking mm-hmm. about like, Hey, there's the Geno Atkins of the world and the Aaron Donalds of the world. And there's some other guys that have kind of, even though they're still outliers, they have succeeded at that height. If it's under six foot, then it could become problematic. Mm-hmm. So now I think we went over most of uh, the top prospects that Rutgers has. Is there anyone like that's kind of catching your eye early on? Any young guys, even like a senior I might have missed? No, I, I think I think you hit everybody, uh, everybody pretty good. Um, there was mm-hmm. I, I think Reggie Sutton is an offensive yes. lineman that I had on my list, an offensive mm-hmm. guard who I actually just reached out to the uh, staff about trying to get an interview with him. Mm-hmm. He, I think, has a uh, potential as a draftable player. Um, he's a very interesting player and I know he's six, four, 200, uh, 305 mm-hmm. pounds. He kind of fits that profile. He, he's a good athlete on the interior. So he'd be one guy and then uh, not a younger guy, but I know the defensive end, uh, Mike, I don't, I don't know how to say uh, it. Like, to off. To off. Yeah. 97. Yeah. He's, it's kind of like that lunch pail blue collar dude who mm-hmm. might, he might not be anything more than maybe a rotational special teams type player. But I think that he has a shot depending on, on the type of season that he puts out in 2021. Awesome. And then um, I guess the last question I have for you, we go back to this college uh, gridiron showcase that you do. I'm not like 100 percent, but I'm like 90 percent sure there's been a couple of Rutgers guys in it over the years. Uh, how hard is it to kind of scout these guys and pick out who's going to come to the showcase? And I, I guess just how difficult is it like seeing all the film as there's so many prospects out there? Yeah, it, the one the one positive and, and the one plus that the college gridiron showcase has is they actually have uh, so they have three different rosters technically right they okay. have one high level roster which is like hey these are the draftable players these are the mm-hmm. guys that have like a legitimate high potential shot they have a secondary roster which is like maybe draftable but maybe priority free agent type and then they have another mm-hmm. roster that is purely small school kids that maybe are on the radar a little bit but like you don't know you need to see them in person type of thing so they have the ability to bring, I think, like 200 guys when all okay. said and done, which Jeez. is fantastic. And we have it split up into regions. So, like, my region is working up from Texas all the way up through the Midwest, up into, okay. like, the Dakotas area. So, like, we have a really good staff that is able to touch base with, you know, pretty much any level from FBS to FCS to Division two, Division three, NAIA. I mean, it truly is, mm-hmm. like, if, if you can play – we will find you type of thing. So yeah. uh, we have, we have a lot of things going for us and it's really nice just to see the growth in the game this past year. And this being my first year with the game, I'm excited for mm-hmm. the potential because there's a lot of kids that went back to school with, you know, the COVID pandemic and, and yeah. uh, the transfer portal getting out of control at some instances. So I'm excited to see the type of roster that we can put together with what it seems like a high volume of draftable players. All right. All right. That's all I really got for you, man. Uh, the last thing I'm going to ask from you is um, just tell people where they can go check out these articles. I know you said you had one on Bo Melton. You're trying to get one with Sutton and I'm sure you have probably a bunch of other guys coming too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you want to look at like the legitimate scouting reports that I have developed, you know, from uh, working in the past with some former NFL scouts, you can check out coast to coast mm-hmm. scouting where I'm putting out reports almost daily. Um, if you want the human interest side of everything, the, the featured articles, like you said, Bo Melton coming out pretty soon. You yeah. to expand the box score. And, you know, if you follow me on Twitter at rise and draft rise, the letter N draft, 
you will be able to find all the content and all the um, insight into the 2022 NFL draft. Perfect, man. Thanks a lot. I appreciate everything. Absolutely, man. I appreciate you.